um, UDS. And one of the, I mean, to start at the beginning, actually. <laughs> it's probably a good place to start. Um, so for a while now, um, Ubuntu has obviously derived from Debian, but we have a tendency to um, do some of our own projects either for commercial reasons or for technology reasons. And um, one of the projects we've been working on for quite a while is sorting out boot. Um, this, they were kind of, there's kind of several reasons for this. Um, we're trying to do a Linux distribution that's actually usable by the majority of masses who do just think they have to reboot something to, to get it to work again. Um, we're sort of trying to do, you know, obviously deal with the fact that um, I know that when I boot my computer that plugging things in and unplugging things in is not generally a good idea. Uh, my mother doesn't. Um, in fact, my mother's usual approach to, to booting is halfway through the boot, pulling out everything that's connected to the computer just in case it causes it to go wrong. Um, this didn't work on Ubuntu for some reason. Um, and also, the, you know, um, commercial reasons right now, um, netbooks, tablets, and um, little tiny computers are kind of the fashion, and if they take a minute to boot, you may as well just go off and use the desktop or go off and use the laptop. So fast booting is kind of important. So we've had very much sort of a, a project to, to take and look at this boot problem and um, solve a lot of the problems. Um, at the same time, we've been dealing with the Linux 2.6 kernel. Um, when we started Ubuntu six years ago, we actually made a very dis early decision at that time that the Linux 2.6 kernel was going to be the best kernel for us to base our distribution off. It, um, at the time, was just starting to get support for Hotplug, um, which later became UDEV and you know, HAL and all that. You know, this, the idea that you can actually plug a camera in and it appears on the desktop and you can drag your photos from it and you can um, you know, unplug your camera, plug another one in, you know, the, the hot plug stuff, which didn't even exist sort of five, six years ago, was sort of just, sorry, 10 years ago, was now coming to be important. And at the time, everyone else was still on 2.4. I think we were on the first to go 2.6. Um, so we've also been dealing with the distribution where um, previously we could make assumptions about the computer. We, you know, the kernel was had drivers compiled into it or it didn't. It, everything was a module it wasn't. Um, you'd have an Etsy modules file to load up the necessary modules um, on boot, and you know you may have had a script that kind of tried to figure it out by the old-fashioned way, but generally it was all hard-coded in those days. Um, and we were very much, because we were starting, in some ways we were starting from Debian, in other ways we were starting from scratch, because the great thing about Debian is there's so many packages to choose from, you get to choose which ones you're actually going to put into a, a smaller CD distribution. So we, we very much had to choose some of this stuff from scratch, so we had we very much chose to go the hot plug router, which became UDEV later on, which yeah, is, is this kind of modern Linux system sort of approach we have today. Um, so these kind of projects have been ongoing. I mean, I was, um, when I started at Ubuntu, I was the D package maintainer here at Debian, um, and was doing sort of package management stuff for about six, nine months, and then uh, sort of got, in, got involved with the boot stuff back in, uh, it was like October, November 2004, so very, very early on, and we sort of, ported Ubuntu over to using UDEV and all this kind of stuff. And um, it, we kind of started there and um, have been building up on that ever since. So with all these projects kind of going on and um, with all of these, these kind of little bits, we've ended up with a situation where we took a look at, right, this is how everything boots. Um, you, you know, your computer boots up, you get your BIOS, your kernel, your init RAMFS, whatever, and then your init system comes up. And in sys5init, that starts a, it works at about 10, 11,000 lines of shell script. I actually overheard somebody today, um, the day before yesterday in the hack lab looking at Debian's boot system for the same reason, and they came up with 10, 11,000 lines of shell script. And you know, you're running all this stuff just to boot the system. There's a dependency and ordering system written in shell on top of this, and, or you know, nowadays at least in serp is written in C. Um, and you know, you, you're basically, you're gonna have this, you've got this very, very complex system to bring up a system. Um, which you would think, because of its complexity and number of lines of code, is bulletproof. And it actually kind of turns out that it's not. Um, and it turns out, you know, let's, th th let me take the most simplest example I can, I can come up with, because it's a real world example, and it, we, we have to deal with it, is that, you know, removable hard drives, um, USB hard drives, we all kind of have them to put you know, storage on, um, I know my sister has one, and she's got episodes of um, the OC and um, anything else, really, of that kind of 
I think ilk on it, you know, she's, everyone has these removable drives. So, you know, you, you've got your removable drive, you can put it in your FS tab or, you know, you use your little GUI configuration tool to make sure it's on the file system somewhere, and you boot. And you've forgotten to plug in this USB enclosure. And, well, it turns out that kind of that doesn't always work, and you end up with a, you know, sometimes everything after it in FS tab doesn't come up, sometimes it doesn't commit mounted, um, and sometimes the boot just sort of hangs for a little while and then carries on. Um, worse still, you know, if th that's just an example if it's a data drive. If it's an external drive um, or even just a separate drive, like a RAID or an LVM device, um, which is your slash user partition or your slash var partition, and that takes longer than usual to come up, you know, the, the, the array it's on might take longer than usual to spin up. You may have turned on your laptop or your desktop and forgotten to switch on the enclosure to so lean over and switch it on and just time it out differently. You can end up with all sorts of things falling over and collapsing on top of each other repercussions. And that's also true of kind of networking and everything else. So we, all, you know, we knew we had this UDEV system. We knew we had events from the kernel when devices came up. We knew that we wanted to sort of pare down the boot system to be run just what we need to run, not everything else. And we knew that if, you know, the event system allows us to remove race conditions because um, we know when things are available. We know when a network device is there, we know when a hard drive's there, so we can take action on that, we can you know, synchronize these things together. And that's pretty much where AppStart came from. <coughs> it was, um, it, we started it 2006, so it's quite a long time ago now, and um, been steadily kind of plodding away at it ever since. And it's, very, it's an init system, it replaces the, the sys5 init package in, um, de in Ubuntu. In fact, Ubuntu we don't have we, we don't build sys5 in its binary package now. We still build init scripts from it. But, uh, yeah, I mean, so there's a couple of bits in the source package we disable, um, but we certainly we disable yeah. building of init from sys5 in its source package. Um, we the init this bin init binary comes from the upstart package in Ubuntu, and um, we you know we are able to then build up a, a completely different boot system. And in fact, and, and it's so. It's been very much a slow, gradual process. We didn't start out with a flag day. We didn't say, right, today we're going to boot, boot with Upstart and everything must be converted over. And this was quite deliberate. We started off with a, a superset of sys 5 init functionality. So sys 5 init has these kind of init scripts and everything else, but that's actually sort of sys 5 rc We can kind of ignore those for now. sys 5 init itself just has that init tab configuration file. And there's an, only a very limited amount of stuff you can do in that init tab configuration file. So it turned out it was really easy to write upstart jobs to do exactly the same things as those that init tab configuration file and encapsulate in its own internal logic put towards run levels in just a little bit of code. So what we did was we replaced the init daemon, wrote a couple of jobs and some support utilities like shutdown and tell init and so on to sit along with the init daemon um, and provide run level support and make sure you know wtump and utump are updated and all that kind of fun jazz. And then based on those, you can then run the sys5rc scripts, which in Debian would be int serve. In Ubuntu, we're still using sys5rc. Um, and that still allows you to then replace the init daemon while still booting exactly as you did before. But at least now, you've got the ability to move on and experiment with the new init system and say, right, okay, well, we're booting with the old stuff. That all still works. Now let's start moving some bits over to the new stuff. And over the... <coughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's my throat. Um, no, <laughs> over, the last, over the last year or so, we've been very much attacking this, and uh, in fact, Ubuntu now is out of the box, probably three quarters upstart now, and only about a quarter in it, there's five in it, it's about, sounds about right. Um, so we've, we've gradually been able to convert over our boot, our boot system to this new system. So that's kind of a, 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 little, bit of a, a little bit of history and tour on, on Sys5 in it, and that's why we wrote upstart. Now, Obviously, um, so as I said, I was talking to Zach at um, UDS. Now, for us, this is quite a major piece of work that we've done for Ubuntu. And um, we've, you know, we're very much convinced we're, we've got a right approach here. And it's something that, you know, obviously, we're, it's a big delta for us from Debian. You know, we've replaced the init system. That means anything with an init script is ultimately likely to be replaced, or at least forked, or, well, not, sorry, not forked, um, branched. It's the right word I'm looking for in Ubuntu. You know, we're looking at, we're going to have to at some point take every single package that's got an init script, we're going to have to modify that to use upstart, which is going to build a huge 
branch between Ubuntu, a huge delta between Ubuntu and Debian. And we like collaborating with Debian. And we like being able to get all of our upstream changes in Debian. It's great. It, it means we don't have to worry about them again. Um, you know, maintaining patches and merging them every six months is a pain in the ass. Um, <laughs> and also, it's, kind of, it's nice to do this kind of thing and get things back into Debian. And this is something where we would like to get this back into Debian. We would like Debian to adopt Upstart and um, sort of be able to, to collaborate with you. Manoj. So yeah, please, oh yeah, please just shout out because I do want to sort of talk with this. Talk. There are mics here. So I do want everyone to kind of shout out. I want this to be more of a boss than me just talking, so. Okay, so I have a kind of narrow interest. I kind of like Upstart. I would love to be able to use it. Mm -hmm. I am also interested in SE Linux mm -hmm. and security in general. Yep. And even though I have had a hiatus with Debian for the last six months and SE Sorry, Linux, I have had a hiatus. I got a new job and yeah. things take time. Mm -hmm. uh, however, I think I'm going to become, be able to come back to Debian in the short order. And I would like to at least create a maybe a KVM image where people can run out of the box, uh, strict policy and running Debian, mm -hmm. and uh, be able to run a really secure system. One of the concerns in something like that for, for people who actually want to run strict policy as mm -hmm. opposed to the old uh, targeted policy only part of the system is secured is you want to minimize the amount of code yeah. that actually runs or that is variable. Mm -hmm. One of the things that is an anathema is a init ID. Mm -hmm. If you really want a secure system, you turn off modules, mm -hmm. you build everything into your kernel, and you make sure that nothing else loads. Because that way, there are fewer chances of a bad guy adding a module. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is you don't want to divert init away in order to provide a wraparound upstart. Yeah. So the SysV in it has been running a patch uh, for oh, six or seven years now, I think, or longer, yeah. where in early boot, it goes and loads the security policy. Yes. It's a small patch, about 50 lines or so, or thereabouts when I wrote it. And there's a similar patch for upstart. It does add, so the complexity of the patch isn't high, but it does add uh, lib se Linux 1 yep. as a dependency. Uh, and the more code you add to a init script, I can understand that there is some concern about uh, whether that leads to it becoming unstable or source of bugs. Yep. However, since we, I added the patch to sysv init, I think it was 2003 or four. Or, mm -hmm. So it's been about at least six years. I yeah. have never had a bug report that libc Linux caused any problem with either D package mm -hmm. or in it. So it's a mature library. It's minimalistic. It's be looked over by some very smart people, smarter than me, who <laughs> who deal with uh, systems running in three letter agencies in the United States where you can't have your machine go down while you are mm -hmm. halfway over. Afghanistan, for example. Yeah, okay. So I posit that the risk introduced by Libya Linux, which is transitively essential in Debian, mm. is going to be minimal. However, there has been very little movement on the patch that I submitted to Upstart. So um, just can I just get the projector on as well? I just want to actually demo something on the projector while I'm doing it. Um, okay, so. Yeah, there I see SE Linux and Upstart. Where I can just summarize for you, there's, there's two things. For where do I see SE Linux and Upstart? Um, so Upstart, the upstream project, doesn't have support directly for SE Linux because no one's actually submitted it. And I, I know you've said you've submitted it, but I actually, I did, when I was talking about this on Debian Devel a few weeks ago, whenever it was, I actually looked into it, and you, only, you submitted it to the Debian bug tracking system, so the Debian maintainer has never submitted that patch to me. <laughs> and um, there was a discussion way back when, when we started, about SE Linux support in Upstart, and my response was pretty much, yeah, please, I, you know. Um, so in Ubuntu, we use AppArmor, and um, that means that I, and I tell you what, I do not care about AppArmor either. Hello. Oh, um, 
I was at your leisure. I just raised my hand for a mic. Yeah. Uh, Michael Beeble on IRC says, please let Manoj know that Upstart and Debian has been shipping this patch for the past two months. Right, yeah. So, <laughs> Bill, I was just going to come to that. Uh, hi, Michael. Um, Sorry, I have been out of touch with Debian for six months, so yeah. I didn't know. Hang on. Let me just, I want to do two things. I want to sort of talk about it. What do you mean, error of... Okay. Michael has submitted it to you. He has now. <laughs> okay, the other thing I might add, LSMs. Uh, there was some discussion way back when about choosing one particular security model. So ever since LSM came about, there have been three LSMs that have been uh, mm. accepted. is SC Linux, Tomio, and AppArmor. Yep. Out of this, exactly one, which is SC Linux, uh, needs a patch to the Unix yeah. system to so bring up. Now, actually, I was gonna, just going to talk about AppArmor as well. So AppArmor, we actually do do some stuff with Upstart and AppArmor where um, Upstart's model allows you to, say, have a service, and it allows another job or a service to hook into that service being started. So we use this for AppArmor to um, apply the AppArmor policy for that service before it comes up. Um, and we're able to do that in the AppArmor model, because AppArmor is all about load a configuration file, cap it into the kernel. So AppArmor's been relatively low touch for me. In fact, I haven't had to take taxi there to care about it. The security team at Ubuntu care about AppArmor, and apparently, my laptop doesn't care about projectors anymore. Um, and, um, you know, it, it, I've not been able to worry about it. SE Linux, I understand, it needs to be a little bit more to worry about it. And... Well, you had it for a second. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's Maybe if you go to sit on the table... It should work now. There we go. I have to sometimes reboot this laptop. It's, it's, it's Maverick's X server. Right. Um, hang on, let me just... So I want to talk about one thing while I'm doing it. So... Um, so, you know, I know with SC Linux, we're going to have, we need a patch to the init system that loads the default system policy, then re-execs the init daemon to take, make sure that it takes effect for the init daemon. Um, that's the patch Michael's got, and I have no upstream concerns with that patch. I'd like to include that upstream. I've gone back to Russell Coker. Unfortunately, we, we have a copyright assignment policy, so I've gone back to Russell Coker to ensure that's all dotted and crossed to make sure we've actually, you know, got the permission to include it in source code and all this kind of stuff. So that's on track. Um, I know it's in the Debian package now. So Debian should be free to use SE Linux with Upstart in that manner. Um, I, the other thing that we're kind of, with AppArmor, we're doing this flexible policy loading in hook. With SE Linux, my understanding is that needs to be a little bit more in code. Um, so actually, I just wanted to kind of show one difference. One thing you talked about was the amount of code that you have to debug. Um, so if I bring up, um, no. if I bring up the debug package here, we can look at the um, debug init script. Let me get out of the way. So this is the init script to start the dbus daemon, which is a very simple daemon. I mean, it's, it's a modern daemon. It's written for a bunch of things that, you know, it uh, just does everything the right way. It forks off into the background. And, you know, this is the init script for it. There's a lot of code there. There's a lot of stuff that you're going to have to audit with SE Linux. There's a lot of stuff you're going to have to care about. There's a lot of stuff, you know, you're going to have to worry about what start stop daemon does. If an update start stop daemon does something and opens a different file in prop, you're going to have to care about it for SE Linux. If the, you know, all of this stuff, gonna, it makes it complicated for you to audit in SE Linux. We don't, we don't use this in its script. We're, we're an upstart system. We have an Etsy in its dbus.conf, which is, fits actually in one terminal. Um, and that does exactly the same thing. That I'm not, you know, we always talk about this idea that we you know 10,000 lines of init, you can't take a thousand line init script and get rid of all that code. Actually, we didn't. That is still doing exactly the same thing as the init script. The difference is the actual bringing up the process Getting, putting it in the right environment, adding limit resource limits and stuff like that can be handled by the init daemon in Upstart. The Upstart job format is not a description of how to start a service and how to stop a service. It's a description instead of what to start and what's, you know, what's to keep running. Um, and this, from a SE Linux point of view, should make it much easier to audit. The other thing I, I actually, did, when I, right back, way at the beginning when we start, when someone came to me about SE Linux. Oh, apparently I could have been more the Um that way around? Doesn't really move it. Sure. Okay. <laughs> um, and you know, right back when we when we started this, I actually said um, I'd love to do SE Linux, and I'd like to make sure it's done right as well. So, for example, it occurred to me like you know the upstart code to start a job. It occurred to me that you could do have some sort of SE Linux code in there as well, so it allows you to be flexible, you know, in defining the job, more policy restrictions, and so on. I don't know whether that's appropriate or not, but someone from SE, you know, someone who knows about SE Linux should certainly 
have a look and see whether there's more useful stuff that can be done there. So I guess that kind of answers your question in a sense of, uh, yeah, I would like to do, I'd like someone to do SE Lux and upstart. <laughs> to this, there, with upstart being different, yeah. we, as I said, we, I would be happy to work with you to figure out if there's additional things that we can yeah. put in there. Uh, policy loading is just one of the things that we can do, and policy yeah. loading, unfortunately, does have to go in early into the kernel yes, indeed. before you do anything else, um, because unfortunately, you can't run any of these scripts before policy is loaded, because by default it will be denied if you're running strict yep, policy. Yeah. So you do need to load policy early, but there are all kinds of other things that uh, so far we haven't done because it is not easy. I don't want to write uh, init scripts for every single package that I think can benefit. Yeah. But this might be something that I can do. Yeah. So this seems a lot simpler. Yeah, it is. And I would be happy to work with uh, folks in Ubuntu because I think you guys might be doing things slightly differently at this point than Debian does. Yeah, we do. We we use AppArmor, but I mean, way of, another way of looking at it would be I'm, you know, I want from an upstream point of view of Upstart, I'm quite happy to support AppArmor and SC Linux and get. You know, like, it should yeah. be the choice of the user. Yeah, and, exactly. Uh, and it's, it's the, anything the that we do in SC Linux makes it totally optional. If you don't want yeah. SC Linux, it has less than. What was it like? One ninth of one percent overhead yep. at startup and nothing exactly. afterwards. Cool. So. Okay. Cool. Thank you, Mana. Yeah. I, Zach. I just wanted to. Well, I think the good occasion of this buff is actually uh, looking at the the upstart issue from a way from a higher point of view. Yeah. So I think the the main question is: Are there any sp specific and substantial technical objection? On, of having upstart in Debian. So I know there are some, I know we cannot you know, answer in this room, but this yep. is a good start. And then I think the, the way forward is posing the same question in the upper place, like develop or the tourist yep. team or. Okay, so I'll, I'll let Steve answer that one. Because well, Russ is grabbing, grabbing the mic, he wants to go first. Uh, uh, you, you, you go ahead. Okay, I'll go ahead and proxy the main concern that I know with upstart. Um, and the reason why when we talked about this with Petter last summer, um, things haven't moved forward since then. Yep. It's because as soon as we drop upstart into Debian as the default init system on the Linux ports, um, our FreeBSD port, which is a release architecture for this cycle, is in a world of hurt because once these facilities are available, even if you give them a policy mandate not to, uh, people are going to be eagerly converting to the much simpler system and then packages are just not going to work on yep. FreeBSD anymore. So that's a significant problem that we need to, to resolve this incompatibility between upstart and FreeBSD in some fashion. So okay, are there plans to actually how to attack this kind of problem? Um, so it actually comes directly to the question that I was going to ask, which is that I have so a whole bunch of packages that have init scripts, and I would love to provide upstart scripts for people mm -hmm. who are using upstart. Um, is there any way that but the, one of the problems that I'm running into right now is I don't know, I haven't been able to figure out some way where I can ship an upstart script for people using upstart and an init script for people using uh, uh, the init system. Yep. And that seems like that would also ad partly address that problem because if we require every package have both, the upstart script can do anything exciting and fancy that it wants to do and the init script is still there. You know, over time we may get, the, the BSD folks may still be somewhat unhappy because fewer people will be testing the init script, but at least they're not completely screwed. Of, we'd kind of ruled out that, that particular we, migration we path. We ruled out in Ubuntu. Well, we ruled it out as well for Debian on account of, well, first of all, because the, the migration path involves continuing to run SysV init scripts on a, in a, on a transitional basis where upstart will call into RC. Okay, yeah. but I'm, you know, I'm happy to add something to the beginning of my init script that says, um, if I am actually already run under upstart, go away. Yeah, that's quite doable. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, yeah. what, would, what would it take to uh, port upstart to other kernels? I have no idea. I, so I, no, I'm just going to be pretty open here. Um, so wh why is upstart a problem for FreeBSD? The reason, simple reason is um, when you go and write an init system, you start look, you know, you, you, it becomes bonded to the kernel. You can write a really simple init system, which isn't bonded to the kernel. But as soon as you want to do one thing, it's actually on this screen. So, Upstart, exec, dbus, daemon, system, fork. 
So that forks off into the background and everything else. So dbus forks, it actually forks twice because it's a daemon. And yeah, I can still run status dbus and it's still got the right PID. So it's doing tracking of the PID even after forks and execs. And AppStart uses that information all the time. Um, so that I only know how to write for Linux. Um, Upstart also has a rich, a rich event sources. You know, the idea that it's event-based in its system means you kind of want to be able to do things when events happen, when drives appear and drives disappear and network cards appear and disappear. I only know how to do that for Linux. So what would it take to some, for someone to you know, port Upstart to FreeBSD would be, it needs to be a FreeBSD developer who knows the FreeBSD kernel well enough to be able to do these kind of functionality in a FreeBSD kernel. Um, that's kind of the problem. Yeah, I, would, I would say that, as Russ said, if we can have a way to have both, actually that can yeah. even motivate people from the FreeBSD side to actually do the, yeah, the port more than it's motivating now to do that. I mean, mm -hmm. if it is not used anywhere, people just don't care. Yeah, I mean, one thing to consider is that, you know, we have this, you know, we could, so right now in Ubuntu, we're doing it differently. We've transitioned from init scripts to um, upstart scripts and um, only the upstart scripts go into the binary package and a symlink gets dropped so people can learn the difference. Um, but that's because we don't support switching init systems in Ubuntu. But Debian, for example, there were, there were a couple of possibilities we've mo mooted. Um, the first one is that, um, as, as Steve said, the one that's kind of simplest is probably, as you say, ship both, and in the init script just don't run if the upstart's running. And that would be really easy to do. I mean, you can just... <laughs> There's, I can think of about 20 different ways to tell whether the init system is actually upstart or not. Um, and that's probably the easiest one is just, yeah, uh, just yeah do that just if it's not running upstart, so that will return an error. Um, <laughs> I, I was just going to say that uh, the, the OpenSSH packages in Ubuntu ship both oh, uh, do, upstart they? and init scripts, and that's because, uh, so for most things, it's not too important, but for uh, but, but people very often run SSHD in a true root for one reason or another, and mm. uh, Upstart can't yet supervise that. Yeah. Uh, so I ship the init script just so that it's not hosing people who are uh, who are running in a true root. Yeah. And you could it's kind of slightly awkward at the dev helper level right now, but it's not too bad. Yeah, I was going to say actually, I mean that would be that would also solve that problem for Debian temporarily. Um, I was going to note there, too, is, is that I think that in practice in Debian, uh, the only way we would ever get upstart into Debian is if there was, if we was this ability to switch back and forth. Yeah. And we ran into that with, in, with, with InServe. I mean, it's just we're not going to be able to just do a transition. We're going to have to support multiple init systems for some period of time, and then hopefully people will converge. Yeah, I mean, the other option we did talk about was this idea of having a support library or support binary which could run, could read an upstart job and basically do it as if it was an init script, but... A year later, no one's actually been able to write this thing. It turns out to be really hard. Um, I'm not sure how much effort has actually been put into that, honestly. Between myself and Michael, several weeks of Oh, work. okay. Yeah, I, I've had a go at it, and I didn't manage to get it to work either. I can, you can get to start them. You can't get to stop the processes again. Upstart relies on being in it to find where the process is. <laughs> yeah. PID so, files, so maybe synthesizing PID files. I, huh? I assumed all along that it w you were going to synthesize PID files well, You don't know what the PID is if it forks. You lose the PID. Yeah, exactly. And then you may as well just use an script. Um, but you don't want to use an init script because then you can't migrate. I know. But so that maybe that, maybe that's the right way to do this. As, as you say, maybe the right way to do this is instead to say, you know, we can transition the upstart. We can transition the SBIN init binary to upstart tomorrow in Debian very easily, and that will still continue to run everything exactly as it does today, um, and then allow packages to ship both disabling the init script if upstarts the sys5 init, it's the init daemon. Um, and um, you know, that would allow you to switch backwards and forwards. You could install sys5 init reboot and still come up with the init scripts. You could put upstart in reboot, come up with the mixed job format we have today. Um, it would allow you true roots to work if you did that clause properly, because then true root would come up with the init system as it was before. Um, I can't really see any downsides here at the moment. So, so regarding the somebody well, said, was it was it you Russ said that uh, you know we can we can have policy mandates or maybe it's Steve we can have policy mandates all we like but people will upload yeah. things. Um, we do have auto rejects on certain Lintian tags now, and uh, there if we if we wanted to say we'll ship the init daemon as long as nothing you nothing relies on it alone, then we could have a Lintian tag that's, re that's auto-rejected by FTP master. 
don't we already have um, a policy must directive saying that if you want to do something in it, you've got to run, provide mm -hmm. SSV in it? All we need to do is said that if you also want to support us, start this is recommended, sorry, optional, not recommended now. Yeah. I wish you'd change it back. <laughs> Um, I mean, yeah, in, in practice we do because the init, tab, uh, the init tab is a configuration file which is owned by a different package, so you don't get to go modify it. So if you want something to happen during boot, you pretty much have, you know, essentially you have to do that. I mean, I, the first step for me would be that we, was, before we, that we went down this path, we'd write a policy, uh, we'd add something to policy that says if you, have, if you ship an upstart job, you must also ship an init script which does the same thing if upstart is not running. Yeah. And if upstart is running, it's kind of up to you because you might want to do what Colin's doing with SSH, but for the most part, you want to not run. Yeah. And then you may also have, like, you know, later on you may decide that, for example, Linux systems like UDEV and stuff could just choose not to ship in its script later on. But, you know, that, that would be, a, you know, later on. If I, I think that, uh, what uh, Russ said, we don't actually need to change policy. We already have something that says we want to run something at init. You must provide... Uh, in its script, and it has to be you invoke something about run. Uh, we, we could use the asynchronous. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, so what a couple of people said here is that we could we could stand to be more explicit. I suspect that policy, because it was never anticipated, the idea that you would not have a sys5 init system probably doesn't ever somewhere explicitly say you must use the sys5 init system the same way it doesn't explicitly say you must use RM to remove files. It's kind of a, <laughs> it was written with that assumption. So curiously, it does seem to say the et cetera init D directory contains the scripts executed by init at boot time. So technically, it's a policy violation for upstart to run jobs out of Etsy init. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yes, in fact, I think we need to make somehow, somehow explicit that there is technical agreement that we want to support also upstart yeah. in Debian. So it seems that there is this kind of agreement in this room. We need to check if there is this agreement also elsewhere. But I mean, the fact that policy people agree with that is a very good start, of course. Yeah. So having it written explicitly in the policy that it is supported and what you need to do to use it, it's kind of needed, I think. And somebody with a laptop files a bug on policy right now, it will help. So I'm taking notes for the session. I have a Gabi document open on gabi.debian.net, and I'm recording everything. I'm not going to file the bug right just yet. Um, is it possible to have a, a reliable Lintian error about this that we can auto-reject on? Yeah, if the, if the package ships something in ETC in it. Um, well, I, I, yeah, I think that if it includes an init script, and if it includes an upstart job and doesn't include an init script, we, and then, I mean, there are some cases where you might want to override that. Yeah, then you can override an upstart package. Or I, I was going to say, can, uh, can auto-rejected tags be overridden? Yeah. Right, so upstart itself, or yeah. upstart can pass this for no, you, or whatever it is. Itself. Is it all There's upstart now? Um, then uh, that will need to do that. Right. I mean, in this particular case, we would, I, Lintian should, up, should whitelist upstart because I don't like having the obvious candidates have to write overrides. But yeah. but yeah, there's two classes of FTP master reject tags, one of which can be overridden and one of which can't. And for this purpose, I think there's enough reasons why you might possibly want to override in weird cases where the upstart job is doing something that's unessential for an init script system that it would, should go into the overridable section. Yeah. So, um, the, yeah. So Maybe go ahead and close out this thread. And yeah. Then okay. Switch. Okay, I just wanted to, to kind of make a, a plea from the user perspective, uh, sysadmin perspective. I mean, they live and die by these init scripts. A lot of times, uh, sysadmins are going to end up writing their own. So yep. if for squeeze plus one or whenever this is going to happen, if this is really the way Debian's going to go, uh, it'd be nice if basically it were all or nothing from a sysadmin perspective so they're not... Yeah, I mean, the all or nothing's kind of complicated because it's a lot of work. I mean, but I mean, the Debian, re I'm sure, let, let me be nice, uh, the Debian release time scale is such that we could use a re Debian release cycle partnered with Ubuntu to do the migration. I mean, you know, we can, we can work, if that's a, in, if that's uh, important to Debian to, to migrate, you know, if not all, but majority or whatever, then we can work with Debian to do that. I mean, we've got manpower to do that. So one thing that's been done in Ubuntu to try to mitigate that concern is identifying suitable higher level interfaces that we can recommend to administrators that they use. So rather than invoking init scripts directly when you want to manage things, um, calling service for, for managing jobs being running or not, 
um, there was some, there were some plant, yeah. And if you run sudo service debus status, what does that give you, Scott? I don't remember, because that one's like that. Yeah, that one just gives you. There we go. And then there's also. So unfortunately, like, unfortunately, the wrapper doesn't point you at service, yeah, which, is, which is the generic interface. Hot one does. Yeah, if you do etsy init db bus oh, status, okay. you get use the service utility. Oh, you may also use the status, right. Yeah, you may also use status, which is the upstart native one. So, yes, I... I so, we, we have, we, so we've done both ways. When we've migrated, we've also tried to provide education so about the new way. Yeah. So ab about that, I think the, the next step is deciding who is going to do the work. Because essentially, so you very honestly pointed out that for Ubuntu it would be better for Debian to have that in kind of compatibility. Yeah. So on one end, we need the technical backing of the choice. On yeah. the other end, we need the patches. Because, I mean, a lot of Debian maintainers will probably not know about Upstart, and we need the patch to, sure. to have both we have the support for both services. So, so are you willing to, you know, submit the patches? And yeah, so it, something we were talking about yesterday, in the, or the day before yesterday, before everyone got killed on Coney Island, um, was that um, about having teams, that there were teams that have worked between Debian and Ubuntu where they've had members of both Debian and Ubuntu in there, seem to have worked very well for collaboration. So my suggestion here would be that we create a team with Debian folk and Ubuntu folk so everybody interested in this migration can be on there. I'll be on there. I'm sure Steve will be on there. Colin will be on there. You know, people from Ubuntu will be on there. Justin will be on the head of the service utility, you know, and so on. And people from Debian who are interested can join the team. And then as a team together, we will do this, you know, do the conversions both in Debian and Ubuntu side by side. So we'll treat them as a treat it as a cross distribution project to do both. That I think would be the best way to do this. Uh, so um, one thing that we've not talked about yet, uh, and which but which is going to come up the moment we start discussing this on Debian Devel, uh, is um, System D, I believe, sure. is the name of it. Yes. What? I've never heard of that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I mean, there's going to be a technical question as to whether Upstart, if we're going to be changing init systems, whether Upstart is the init system we should change to sure. or whether we should be looking at something else. Can I give you two answers to that? I think the answer to that is pretty simple. I mean, we are not saying that we are going to migrate from System 5 init to Upstart. Mm -hmm. We are saying that we are going to support both. You yeah. can have the same answer for System D, yep. and if no one does the work for System D, you have the answer. That's the exactly what I was going to suggest. I think if we do this as a, you know, as a team, then a group of people can work together to do the Upstart migration, and if the System D folks would like to do the same work, that's up to them. I would say, I, having known, knowing System D pretty well, um, it's, it's going to be much harder for them because they haven't built in support for you know, actually still running init scripts alongside and so on. Um, there are technical reasons I think Upstart's better. Um, Systems is very narrow focused on one way that all services should work. Upstart is much more, takes a much more liberal approach and says that we've got to support existing services. We've got to, um, you know, you, need, you don't just want to do socket-based activation. We're going to do socket-based activation, time-based activation, actually activating it on boot regardless, activating when hardware comes up. So Upstart's a lot more flexible in what it lets you do. And I also said there's a political reason. I mean, yes, Fedora and Red Hat Enterprise Linux are going to use Systemd now. Fedora, Systemd is now the default in Fedora. Um, but Upstart is the default in Ubuntu, which means now Ubuntu and Fedora are incompatible. You may as well consider them to be different operating systems. Um, if you're a system administrator and you learn Red Hat Enterprise Linux, you do not now know how to admin an Ubuntu system. Likewise, if you know how to run an admin Ubuntu system, you do not know, now know how to admin a Fedora system, Red Hat Enterprise system. Though I would say, if you know how to, if you know how to admin an, an, a Linux, a Unix system today, you do know how to admin an Ubuntu system. Systemd is so different, you have to relearn how to admin it. Um, the one thing I would say politically is, in you know, Debian and Ubuntu have this special relationship. I think it would harm that special relationship if Debian also chose to be incompatible with Ubuntu. But that's a political, political one. But I, I still, I, you know, I still stand by my technical design. I think Upstart is better than Systemd. I think Systemd is elegant, but I think Upstart's better. But. When it comes to policy, however, we might, if we put in policy about how uh, Upstart is supported, mm -hmm. there might be pressure to also create a similar policy for system I would, D. I would word policy work loosely enough that it said alternate in its, you may support alternate init systems in your package provided you also support in it and that a group works to do the upstart migration and makes it so the upstart migration is more complete than the 
system demigration. So therefore, the po you know, it becomes not. It becomes then a simple choice of we have this alternate in its system. It's already done, you know, 75% of the work. There's another alternate in the system which is equally uh, open within the Debian project. But that's only done 25% of the work. You know, it becomes a much more easier technical decision if you've done the work first. But that Thank would be my approach to that. Actually, I like that because it kind of fits in the long-standing policy tradition that when you start creating a policy that varies widely from the current policy, you create an auxiliary document which gets polished and ultimately included. So we can say that, okay, we'll start an auxiliary document for any alternative in its system, and whichever one gets polished yeah. will get included. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, so Steve was just going to oh, jump I'm in sorry, first, but ahead. if you're on this thread. Uh, I, I have another topic to bring oh, right. up, so if we, we want to topic. close uh, out this thread. Yeah, I was, just gonna, I was just going to follow up on yeah, that, that, sure. um, that that does suggest that it would, um, that, you know, just to be explicit, we should write, a, we should write an upstart mini policy. Um, mm. And uh, that could probably be, ex be largely based on the existing upstart docs, yep. which, some of which are quite kind of policy or oriented, but um, would it be worth trying to distribute that with Debian policy or should we be distribute, uh, distributing it with Upstart or something initially? Um, I would say you should start distributing it with Upstart. That's usually the way we do this. Um, once it's in the Debian policy package, we want to be able to both consider it to be mostly policy for Debian and also follow the policy change procedure, which you don't want to do for your bootstrap. Mm -hmm. Okay, so apparently, I had a similar topic to bring up, which is that we don't have a policy written for how upstart jobs are supposed to be invoked from maintainer scripts. And before we start seeing lots of adoption of this in Debian, we should probably sort that out, especially given that the relationship between init scripts and upstart jobs is going to be different in Debian yeah. than what it's been in upstart, than what it's been in Ubuntu to date. Yeah, that was actually exactly the question I was gonna ask, which is what is the invoke rc.d and policy rc.d equivalents for upstart? There isn't one today. In Ubuntu, I have been beating the drum that people should continue to use invoke rc.d and policy rc.d because those are specified and we have a wrapper that can do the right thing. But that won't work when we've got both an init script and an upstart job. I mean, and so it has to know which one to do. My, 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 my technical feeling right now is I think invoke rc.d works reasonably well as an interface for maintainer scripts to, to, to do this. I think that the policy.d layer and what we expect of, of administrators who want to make use of it is really hard to understand. So I'm, I'm not a big fan of the exact way in which invoke rc.d is currently implemented, but I think having an interface which does what it's intending to do is very important. So depending on, on where we land with this in Debian versus some of your upstream plans for additional features, how, how's that coming this cycle? Um, we'll worry, we'll, I think from point, so there's upstart some development. I think we should make sure we land 06 in Debian because it's the stable supported one that's in our LTS. So the current version. The current version, which doesn't have the facilities for administratively enabling and disabling jobs. Well, we can. Turning my mic off, yeah. So. Um, yeah, but I mean, we can fix that. I mean, sorry, so one of the things that doesn't quite let you do is enable to disable jobs. Um, but we can fix that in Nord 6. If it becomes, it's never really been a burden for us, but if, we, if there is a pressure, I can, we can put that code into Nord 6. You know, we can add code to let you do that to Nord 6 whilst without having to jump to Nord 10. That's possible, I mean. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's going to be important um, outside, I mean, just speaking as a Debian user for a moment, uh, we will want that facility and we will want Puppet to have, to be understand the upstart in its system yeah. and be able to do that sort of uh, enable disable without just deleting the upstart job yeah. because deleting it is hard to recover from when you sure. want to put it back. Okay. Cool. So we've got five minutes left. Just want to say if there's anything else, any different topics or concerns? Yeah, so. topic. Uh, does Canonical require copyright assignment or for patches to upstart? Yes. Is that going to change? No. Is that going to be a problem for Debian? Well, except that Debian is not upstream for upstart. Debian is packaging upstart. So this, the fact that upstream for upstart requires copyright assignment does not imply that the Debian package of upstart requires copyright assignment. Right. And it's so, basically, we would be in the exact same situation we're in with GCC. Yep. Um, and they, if, you, if you want to know why systemd exists, that's pretty much the reason. Leonard Puttering does not like the copyright assignment policy. I was actually planning on breaking that news to Minoj gently after the session. 
the fact that in order to get the SE Linux patches upstream, they have to be copyright assigned to uh, Canonical. And um, you are currently having enough trouble with your <laughs> contributions to Debian, I believe, with your employment. <laughs> However, they can go in the Debian package. To explain to me uh, in general terms what's involved, and then I'll go and write a patch. <laughs> the, the other thing is the other thing as well to bear in mind. Um, I'm hoping that Mark Shuttleworth is still on his private island. Um, is that we can always carry patches in the Ubuntu and Debian packages which aren't in the upstream code while we sort this out. That is not we've we've done that before. Um, some of the code from Palm existed in the both packages for a while in the state because. Yeah. Um, so just quickly, just we think we've got one minute. So is there any other kind of Concerns or cool. Um, so we'll take some actions. We'll form a team. We'll get this together. Thank you very much, everyone. Sorry, I'm late. <laughs>